It's the murder on the mainland that's got the dead man's homeland up in arms. The killing of the jailed assassin and independence figurehead Ivan Colonna triggered often violent protests in his native Corsica and pushed the question of deeper autonomy high up the political agenda. Back in 1998, Colonna fatally shot a local prefect and was sentenced to life in prison for that crime nearly 10 years later. But by that point, he'd already got a firm following as a local hero of the nationalist cause. Hello and welcome to France in Focus. This week we've flown to a rugged and arrestive island where calls for greater self-governance persist and where tensions have boiled over onto the streets. Corsica has by and large been French since 1769, but some here want the cord slackened, if not snipped altogether. And as you'll find out in this next report, uproar and upheaval have been part of island life for years. August 1975, a group of pro-autonomy militants occupy the wine warehouse of a former Algerian settler, accused of being involved in a financial scandal. Over a thousand gendarmes were sent by the French government to bring the standoff to an end. Two officers lost their lives and one of the militants was injured. The episode heralded the start of a new era of Corsican resistance. Large numbers of Corsicans went to settle in France's colonies across North Africa and in French Indochina. And during the period of decolonization, this influx of former settlers back to the island meant that locals started to feel they were getting a rough deal and that they weren't being given the same financial handouts from the state that these former settlers were getting. One year later, Corsica's National Liberation Front was born. But before the creation of the FLNC, other islanders had already left their mark and strived for change. In 1736, the German adventurer Theodor de Neuhoff attempted to establish Corsican independence from Genoa, which had ruled the island for five centuries. He became the first and only king of Corsica. Twenty years later, Pascal Paoli ended Genoese rule. He was elected president of the Executive Council and wrote one of Europe's most democratic constitutions at the time. He oversaw more than a decade of Corsican independence and transformed the island with his reforms. The key figure of the 18th century was Pascal Paoli. He was a man who wanted to give Corsica a constitution, who set up a national navy and army regiments, who created the university in Corte, and the Paulist regime, which would stay in place for 14 years until 1769. It was King Louis XV's army that ended Paoli's rule and, more importantly, closed the University of Corte. Just a few months earlier, Napoleon Bonaparte had been born in the city of Ajaccio. Like his father, the young general would come to worship Paoli and his ideas. But Napoleon's ambitions would take him far from his native shores and to the center of French and later European power. Ever since then, the history of Corsica has been inextricably and uneasily linked to that of the mainland. Many Corsicans who came out in protest following news that Colonna had been assaulted and killed were youngsters. Growing up in one of the poorest pockets of France and with the feeling that they're being ignored, the island's young population was quick to join the demos. We've driven to the central university town of Corte to meet some students who are hoping that the winds of change will soon blow in. From the front, the Mariani campus of Corsica's university looks like any other higher education institute. But from the back, the building tells a different story, one of anger against the French state and of the frustrations of those who study here. Since the death of Yvon Colonna, the walls of this university have been splashed with anti-French slogans and images of the notorious hero. The site has also become a hotbed of revolt, where young and old have come to meet behind closed doors to discuss their battle plan. 
Rachel Rejette is the daughter of nationalist sympathizers, and she's now one of the mouthpieces of her generation. Our priority is to put the Corsican question firmly back on the table. For far too long now, we have been completely ignored by the French government, so it's high time that we get some answers to our questions. 19-year-old Jean-Baptiste Géronime often pops into the café over the road from the university with his friend Ange Francois. They're both in their first year studying education sciences. They're proud of their Corsican roots and identity and of their dwindling native language, which they prefer to use day to day. Oh, I used to be Divan Colon on Antabef MTV, Today, Jean-Baptiste is keen to show his friend a video he's found online of Colonna speaking while in prison on the mainland. For me, Ivan Colonna represents Corsica. He died for the island, defending our ideals. Since 2015, we've been trying to have a discussion with the French government to push forward the Corsican question. Unfortunately, we've been forgotten about, and it's just sad that Colonna has had to die for our problems to be put back on the table. This push to have a greater say goes hand in hand with another battle, one that youngsters were fighting before Colonna was attacked and killed. As they put their heads in their textbooks, the island students all too often struggle to keep their heads above water as well. With financial insecurity growing, many find it hard to pay their rent or fill their cupboards with food, a situation that's fueled tensions further. With youngsters pushing for change and with many locals believing that their island should be granted more powers, we've come to meet a professor at the university campus in Corte to unpick these issues further. André Fadji, you're a, a professor of political science at the University of Corsica. Thank you for speaking to uh, France 24. My first question is about the, the nationalist movement here on the island. It's been brewing in the background for years, but what's different about this latest resurgence of it? The nationalist movement is a bit out of practice in organizing big rallies. This one is quite unique in terms of the intensity and the frequency. There have been dozens of protests over more than 10 days with surely more than 20,000 people. That's a lot for Corsica. There have also been several incidents that have caught the authorities' attention, even if we're speaking of just a handful of people, maybe 2 or 3 percent of protesters. Many here on the island are calling for greater autonomy. What would that actually look like? How far and how deep could it go? Corsicans believe that autonomy would allow elected officials to intervene directly on legal matters. That means more room for manoeuvre, more authority in decision making, more legal weight in areas like the economy, taxes or urban planning, for example. These areas would need to be negotiated with the government the aim, in theory, would be to establish standards that are more adapted to the Corsican situation and therefore more efficient than the national standards. Now, Corsica already has a rather special uh, status. What does it currently enjoy in terms of benefits? Corsica's administrative status is very different because we merged one region with two administrative departments. The same model was proposed in Alsace in 2013, so it's not exceptional in itself. What stands out, even if it doesn't have much impact in terms of decision-making, is that Corsica has an executive council which answers to the Corsican assembly. This is different from the mainland. It also has some additional powers, but purely administrative, nothing legal or statutory. Let's talk now about uh, Yvon Colonna. Why has he become such an important figurehead for youngsters here? There's a lot of backstory as to why he became a symbol of injustice. Since 2015, the nationalists have held power, and over the past five years, they've widened their majority in local elections. But the French government has given no indication that it intends to listen, at least in part, to their demands. So there's a great deal of resentment and frustration and a feeling of injustice. All this comes together to focus on one person, a man who Corsicans feel should have been allowed to finish his jail time at home. Instead, he was denied permission to transfer from his mainland prison and left at the mercy of Islamist extremists, which probably fueled some conspiracy theories. Just how difficult or problematic has life become for youngsters, for students here in Corsica? 
The Corsican economic model produces wealth, it produces jobs, but it's often unskilled, poorly paid work that offers little job security. The main sectors are construction, seasonal tourism and retail, so fairly unskilled and poorly paid. One demand uh, here in Corsica is that the status of Corsica be written into the constitution. Why is that so important for people living here? Today, the constitution is so rigid. We need to break free of it in order to allow a real evolution in Corsica's status. Determination of legal and statutory powers is set by the constitution. So if the government wants to give Corsica these powers, it will, without question, have to reform the constitution. Political autonomy is one thing uh, in Corsica, but will there be economic consequences of that? If Corsica is given legislative autonomy, you would expect it to focus primarily on the economic and fiscal sectors. Based on this, the economy may well evolve, but the Corsican authorities would have to keep a few jokers in their hand to ensure the market doesn't become a target of financial or even mafia groups. This is a major concern in Corsica, more autonomy, certainly, but the state must be present even more so than today especially on legal matters. André Fadzi, thank you very much for talking to France 24. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, that's all from me and the island of Corsica, but do stay tuned to France 24.